Bill Cosby paid more than three million dollars to the woman he is charged with sexually assaulting. A prosecutor revealed that information to jurors yesterday as the comedian's retrial for sexual assault gets underway. The defense is making its opening arguments today. As Cosby was heading into court on Monday, he was confronted by a topless protester, the woman leaping over a police barricade running towards him before deputies were able to tackle her. New information now on formal complaints made to the Federal Trade Commission with a group of child advocates asking the FTC to investigate YouTube and potentially impose billions of dollars in penalties on Google for allegedly violating children's online privacy and allowing ads to target them. The research has shown that more than 80% of kids, 4 to 13, are on YouTube. And when they're on there, they're essentially being tracked. And parents aren't aware that this is happening. The group claims Google profits handsomely from selling advertising to the kids' directed programs it packages. Hmm. Well, the, uh, the Dow up nicely today. We'll continue to keep an eye on that. Thank you for joining us. Outnumbered starts right now. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Fox News alert awaiting possible new reaction from President Trump after a major plot twist in special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. Any moment now, the president is expected to greet the emir of Qatar at the White House ahead of a meeting between those two leaders. And the president could speak out again about the FBI raid that happened yesterday at the home, offices, and temporary hotel room of his personal attorney. The president called it, quote, an attack on our country, raising new questions over how he might respond to it all. This is Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner. Here today, Sandra Smith, Republican strategist and Fox News contributor Lisa Booth, anchor of the Intelligence Report on Fox Business, bringing intelligence. Tris Regan never gets old. And joining us in the center seat, former Republican presidential candidate and Fox News contributor now Herman Cain is Outnumbered. Hello. Happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, nice Herman. position to be in. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to see you. I'd say. I love that. That's I love great. It. I All love right. It. Let's get to the news. Yes. President Trump is about to welcome the Emir of Qatar to the White House, and we are expecting to hear from him at some point during this hour. We'll take you there live when it happens. While prominent lawmakers right now are advising the president to proceed carefully today, following his angry reaction yesterday to the FBI seizure of business records, emails, and documents from his personal attorney, Michael Cohen. The Wall Street Journal is reporting the action came after a referral from special counsel Robert Mueller to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan. Federal agents were reportedly focused on information related to a $130,000 payment that Mr. Cohen made to adult film star Stormy Daniels just days before the presidential election. Cohen's attorney says the raids were unnecessary because his client has been fully cooperating. Here's what the president said yesterday. We just heard that they broke into the office of one of my personal attorneys, good man, and uh, it's a disgraceful situation. It's a total witch hunt, a disgrace. It's frankly a real disgrace. It's a, an attack on our country in a true sense. It's an attack on what we all stand for. The president wasn't done. This morning he tweeted a total witch hunt, three exclamation points, and attorney-client privilege is dead. But Democrat Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut says prosecutors would not risk doing something this aggressive without a legitimate reason. Here he is. The raid on Michael Cohn's office is like a nuclear strike with a number of warheads, his home, his office, his hotel room. This kind of raid is extraordinary. It could not have been done if there were not near certainty that he was going to either destroy ev evidence or plan or commit a crime that involved obstruction of justice. Blumenthal calling it a nuclear strike. What do you think, Herman Cain? I think it is a nuclear strike, but I disagree with him on one point. He said they wouldn't have done it unless they had some definitive evidence that suggests maybe that was wrongdoing. I don't agree with that. I happen to believe that this is a diversion and it is intended to confuse hmm. people such that it lasts past the November elections. This is a hot mess, and they just added some more holes to the hot mess. You know, Trish, it's in interesting because this notion of actually having evidence hasn't been predicated for the year plus that we've seen the investigation into collusion. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So it kind of points to what the Herman Cain is saying. Well, collusion, whatever that is. But here's the reality, Harris, and we've talked about this before. The minute you get the special prosecutor in there, all of a sudden you've got a can of worms that you're opening up, Pandora's box, so to speak, and you're going in every different direction looking for some kind of infraction. Yes. Um, look, you know, it, it, it certainly, I'm I don't know what the evidence for Go ahead. Trish, but I, I want to speak to what's happening on the left side of the screen. So we had told you earlier that the emir of Qatar is here. Altani is here to meet with President Trump at the White House. And this will be interesting timing because right now the president is trying to decide what he's going to do in Syria and getting, uh, you know, Arab nations and Middle Eastern agent, uh, nations on the same page is important. He's said some things about Qatar and terrorism in the past. So those two men will no doubt talk about some of this uh, in their upcoming meetings. So we wanted to show you his arrival at the White House. When we get next to uh, another point of where the public can watch, we'll bring you that and more news on that. Trish? That said, I, I don't know if this looks so good. I mean, 130 k getting paid to her. Uh, I don't know what evidence they have. They're clearly looking for something. They do not think that Michael Cohn is, uh, is above reproach here. But don't forget about the Pfizer report that's questionable in terms of how valid was it. They used false data for that Pfizer report, and they're still trying to investigate that. So I put this in the same category. To, I don't believe it. To see if it helped kick off exactly. the investigation from exactly. the beginning. Lisa? Well, I think the screams of overreach and Mueller might... Uh, alienate some of even the Republicans on Capitol Hill who have been saying, let's let Mueller run its course, let's, let's, let's let, let this investigation run its course. Mm -hmm. I think he risks alienating those people because this is a clear overreach uh, by Mueller. And President Trump brought this point up yesterday, and I think it's a great point in the sense you look at someone like Rod Rosenstein that has essentially right. given so much latitude and leeway to Mueller in this investigation, so, uh, even looking at things like obstruction of justice, Harris, but he's the same guy that laid out the case uh, for fi firing Comey as well. And so I, I think there's just... Uh, you know, a clear double standard and some very big concerns here. You know, Sandra, I know we've been talking a little bit about Rod Rosenstein and, and potentially his uh, actions in all of this. What have you learned? And having personally signed off on these raids actually taking place, look, this is this is going to get this is going to get heavy, and the political fallout is going to be huge if the president were to take as drastic of a measure as to fire Mueller. The fact that he says that's not in the cards and says, we'll see, that leaves a lot of room for speculation, right, Herman? So what yes. would the fallout be if the president was to move forward in that direction? He's not indicating that that is, that is his choice, but if he did, what would the fallout be? It would be major criticism. And it would go on and on and on and on. But don't forget, remember, Congress can't get information it's been asking for for months. You add that to the mix, and this is why, if the president were to do that, it'll help shift the focus of the things that are really, really important. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah, so there are two camps on this, because yes. I'm sure you've heard that Senator Grassley is saying, no, 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 you don't even want to approach even talking about uh, firing anybody at this point. Right. Right? Exactly. And I would be in the camp of don't hire him, let it run its course, but force the Department of Justice and FBI to give Congress the information it's been asking for that they are entitled to because they are our elected representatives. A bit of strategy going on there. Oh, uh, it's a hot mess, going. like I said. <laughs> hot mess express. <laughs> hot mess express, I like it. Well, I'm supposed to say in the prompter, speaking of which, but I don't know if this is a hot mess until I get to it. <laughs> <laughs> New questions over whether the president is considering removing special counsel Robert Mueller. So let's go deeper with this topic. He was asked about it yesterday. Why don't I just fire yeah, Mueller? Well, I think it's a disgrace what's going on. We'll see what happens. But I think it's really a sad situation when you look at what happened. And many people have said you should fire him. Uh, again, they found nothing. And in finding nothing, uh, that's a big statement. So we'll see what happens. George Washington University law professor Jonathan Turley explained earlier why he feels the president should not go down this road. President Trump took the ill-advised course of firing uh, James Comey against the advice of virtually everyone in the White House except Jared Kushner. Uh, this would be that blunder on steroids. It, would, it wouldn't change anything. It wouldn't stop the investigation. But it could definitely put his presidency in peril. 
All right, let's hear from the other side of the political aisle. This morning, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer urged lawmakers to take action on bills to protect the special counsel. For months, Republicans have said that legislation to protect the special counsel is not needed because they've been assured by nameless people that the president won't fire the special counsel. That assurance has been shaken by the president's comments last night. By his own words, it's clear the president may, may be considering firing the special counsel. I didn't think it was possible, but that man just turned the man next to me into a giggle box. What's Here we go on? again. What's funny? Nameless people. Why do they name who they are for a change instead of calling them nameless people? Look, the fact that this investigation has gone on as long as it has, I'm on the side of don't fire him. They haven't found any there there, and it's going to continue to turn up nothing, and eventually the investigation is going to exhaust itself other than when Mueller decides to go in another direction mm -hmm. to try to drag something else in. They're mm -hmm. just trying to stretch this out until November. Yeah, and you, you also wonder, Trish, I mean, look, look, at the, look at the markets today, Dow surging 500 points, and China apparently coming back to the table on this terrorist issue, saying we're going to open up our country uh, for business and open up our, our economy, bring in U.S. automobiles. And, and, and there's a message that the president could be sticking to here. But we woke up this morning, and he chose to react, and react somewhat fiercely on Twitter about uh, uh, client privileges, attorney client privileges, and this being an absolute witch hunt, which actually brings the focus and the attention back to this. Yeah, no, look, I, I understand that he's angry. I completely, I think any of us would feel the same. Uh, th that said, you make a valid point in that there's a lot of good stuff going on right now. From a policy perspective, I mean, as, as, as much of a struggle and a concern this whole threat of the trade war has been, Look at what's happening today. Now China's saying, oh yeah, you know, maybe it's not so smart to alienate our number one biggest customer yeah. in the world. Maybe we should be charging a 25% tariff on every single automobile that comes in from the U.S. Maybe there's some work that we can be done on a fair agreement. These are wonderful things. These are good things for our economy, good for jobs, good for national security. And yet here we are mired in, yet again, Stormy Daniels. But do you honestly think that the mainstream media is going to cover any of those positive things for the Trump administration. They're not. And no. President Trump is angry, and I think with good reason. Just look at the fact there's a report in Business in Insider that the Mueller team is looking into this 150,000 donation from a pro-Russian Ukrainian oligarch that gave to the Trump Foundation. Guess what? Same guy gave 13 million to the Clinton Foundation, okay? You also look at the double standard, and even in the investigation, uh, that Flynn is Very being charged with one count of lying to the FBI, yeah. yet we know Cheryl Mills and Huma Abedin also lied to the FBI. So if you're President Trump, he's infuriated, and I think he's got some reasons to be, so. This is another, the last word. This is another installment on the speculation derby. That's what it is. Wow. <laughs> the speculation derby, they've added another installment. Does it come with free cotton candy? No. <laughs> popcorn. Do you oh. bet on it? Or? <laughs> I like popcorn. Just All right. popcorn. Can you wear a hat? So we're watching for a couple of things. The president, obviously, yeah. when he comes out in that two-person meeting with the leading, leader of Qatar, but this too, we're awaiting Mark Zuckerberg's arrival at a Senate hearing where he'll face questions about the privacy scandal that has rocked Silicon Valley and beyond. So what can we expect when the... Founder Facebook takes the hot seat. And what will it mean for millions and millions? I think it's 2.2 billion Facebook users. Plus, a high stakes decision from President Trump could come at any moment on the U.S.'s response to a suspected chemical attack in Syria that killed dozens of civilians. We'll talk about the administration's next move. Stay close. We are beyond showing pictures of dead babies. We are beyond appeals to conscience. We have reached the moment when the world must see justice done. We are awaiting remarks from the president. He is inside the White House a meeting with the Emir of Qatar. Um, they, the pool has been called in. The president has been speaking. He did not answer questions of reporters, uh, but they did say that Amir uh, talked about the Amir talked about Syria with the president. They also talked about uh, uh, stopping terrorism funding. Remember, in the past, the president has described Qatar as a funder of terror. He has shifted in that stance. They are having a conversation in the White House. We are going to have those remarks for you shortly. We will bring those to you live when we get them. The monster who was responsible for these attacks has no conscience. Not even to be shocked by pictures of dead children. 
The Russian regime, whose hands are all covered in the blood of Syrian children, cannot be ashamed by pictures of its victims. We've tried that before. We must not overlook Russia and Iran's roles in enabling the Assad regime's murderous destruction. Strong words from our U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley pointing the finger at Syria's Bashar al-Assad, Russia and Iran amid growing outrage over the apparent gas attack in Syria that killed dozens of civilians, including women and children. We're awaiting a vote at the Security Council on Syria as Assad's regime denies a chemical attack even took place. The pres president earlier canceled a planned trip to South America to oversee the crisis in Syria. And a decision on the U.S. response is expected at any moment now. Retired four-star General Jack Keane says we cannot rely on the U.N. to act. And there will be serious challenges facing any possible U.S. military action. Watch. The only thing that's left to us now, because we know we can't deter him, is we have to take away his capability to deliver chemical weapons and take the chemical weapons away itself. What does that really mean? All rotor wing aircraft, all fixed wing aircraft destroyed, all airfields destroyed. What makes it complicated is there's Russians out on those airfields. We should tell the Russians right now that every military base in Syria is vulnerable as a result of this chemical attack. And if you keep your people on those military bases, we are not going to be responsible if they are injured as a result of an attack. So well, more on that in just a second. Meanwhile, we want to alert in here with this meeting taking place at the White House, the president and the mayor of Qatar. Uh, our meeting right now, we're told that the discussion involved Syria and the next actions to take there. Also, um, funding of terror was discussed as well. Uh, the Amir of Qatar and the president are meeting in the White House. Thank you Let's very listen much. to the president. It's a great honor to have the Amir of Qatar with us. Uh, he's a friend of mine, knew him long before I entered the world of politics. He's a great gentleman. Uh, he's very popular in his country. His people love him. Uh, we're working on uh, unity in that part of the Middle East, and I think it's working out very well. There are a lot of good things happening. Uh, also, uh, we have a gentleman on my right who buys a lot of equipment from us, a lot of purchases in the United States, and a lot of military uh, airplanes, uh, missiles, lots of different things. But uh, they've been great friends in so many ways, and uh, we're working very well together. And I think it's working out extremely well. So, Amir, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank President. You. I'm very happy and uh, honored to be here. Thanks for this invitation. Our relationship between uh, Qatar and the United States has been more than 45 years. It's a very strong, solid relationship. Um, our economic partnership is more than 125 billion. And our aim and goal is to double it in the next uh, coming years. Our uh, military um, uh, cooperation is very solid, very strong. As everybody knows, that the heart of fighting terrorism is from Al Udaid base. And um, uh, thank God it's been a very successful campaign against uh, uh, the terrorist uh, groups uh, around uh, our region. Lately, uh, before I come here, I was in Tampa. I visited the CENTCOM, and we met with the generals. And uh, it was um, a very important visit, and it shows how strong our cooperation, uh, cooperation is between uh, uh, the armed uh, forces. Of course, we speak today, and um, we see the suffering of the Syrian people. And uh, me and the president, we see eye to eye that this matter has to stop immediately. We cannot tolerate with a war criminal, we cannot tolerate with someone who killed more than half a million of his own people. And this matter should end immediately. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. And Tamim and I have been working for a number of years now, actually, even before the fact on terrorism. And uh, we're making sure that terrorism funding is stopped in the countries that we are really related to, because I feel related. Uh, but those countries are stopping the funding of terrorism. That includes UAE, it includes Saudi Arabia, it includes Qatar and others. Uh, a lot of countries were funding terrorism and we're stopping it. It's getting stopped and fast, very important. And uh, you've now become a very big advocate. We appreciate that. Thank you, President. Um, we, um, I want to make something very clear, Mr. President. We do not and we will not 
uh, tolerate with people who fund terrorism. We've been cooperating with the United States of America to stop uh, funding terrorism around the region. We do not uh, uh, tolerate with people who support and fund terrorism. I would like to also thank the President for him being involved personally in solving the GCC uh, crisis. He's been very helpful. He's been supporting us uh, during this blockade. And I would like to also thank the American people for being very supportive. And his role is very vital to end this uh, crisis in our region. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. President Trump and the Emir of Qatar meeting in the White House just moments ago. As you could uh, hear the Emir just a few moments ago saying he was happy and honored to be here. And he talked about what he referred to as a successful campaign against terrorism groups in the region. But he said, we speak today amid the suffering in Syria. And that was a major topic of conversation between the two. They will go on to a working lunch. But the Emir said this must stop immediately, referring to Bashar al-Assad, calling him a war criminal. What happens next is the big question. So a couple things about uh, Qatar. We know recently the president called them out on, you know, terrorism. So that's where that came from. It'll be interesting to see if he does the same thing with Saudi Arabia because right. we know their history. But we have 10,000 American troops at an air base in Qatar. We need Qatar. We need Qatar if we're going to hit Syria with anything, uh, except for our battleships maybe, like we have before, because our overseas command, U.S. command, is in Qatar. So those decisions and that brain trust is right there. So we're, we're going to need them. This is why the president said he need 24 to 48 hours to kind of... It's got to work it, these make, relationships. got to work these relationships out. But I think the, I think the uh, Bashad made a mistake in underestimating this president. If those Tomahawk missiles didn't get his attention, and now he's going to go and do this, I think General King nailed it mm -hmm. when he said what we need to do. Here's the other thing that I think that they're underestimating. Russia, as well as Iran, as well as the head of Syria. We have a new sheriff in town. Don't test this president. And that's what I believe they're underestimating. Well, the danger here, though, is that it escalates, right? In other words, we have to be very careful about next moves because of Russia, because yes. of Iran. Um, I agree with you, Herman. I think that it, we are in a very different world than the one that we lived in with President Obama yes. in charge. And you now have a president who's not afraid to actually take action, whatever that may be in Syria. Uh, he's going to do so, though. Uh, to the anger of the Russians, and that's just the reality now that we face as we increasingly find ourselves in a, mm, I don't know, Cold War kind of scenario, for but, lack of a better well, term. And, and I think that's where the focus has been, but also, alternatively, I think there's a danger in not acting, because then you end up down the same road that President Obama did, and drawing that red line and doing nothing, and then essentially nobody respects you, your word is mean meaningless, and the United States is viewed as weak. And President Trump has sort of drawn his own red line, so I think he has to follow through to some degree. Right. Particularly, I, don't, I don't think he won't. Well, but be even not particularly anything, looking no. at things ahead of sitting down with North Korea or even the trade issue with China, then nobody respects you, nobody believes what you say, uh, and it sort of renders you useless on the global stage. You know, stage. it's interesting, Sandra, we are seeing perhaps what the president knew that, that everybody else was speculating out in, in other worlds uh, outside of Fox about why you would make a choice on Bolton at this point. Mm. Now, now we know. I mean, look at all that he has before him. And John Bolton is not a man who's going to toggle back and forth or wiggle room uh, on what his vision is. And he joked and to the president. One of the image that was when we were covering that meeting at this hour yesterday with the president sitting there with, uh, with Ambassador Bolton sitting right over a national security advisor, right over his shoulder on day one of the job. <laughs> What a yeah. first day in your office. I mean, yeah. can you imagine? And here it is, day two. And this is a man that is at the president's side with a major decision where timing is crucial. Uh, you just wonder what the timing is going to be of this. The, initially, it was 24 to 48 hours. Yes. The president would be responding forcibly uh, uh, to and on Syria. Oh, Time is ticking. Uh, if you think about Senator, it, he has just taken a phone call, too, with the Brian, uh, British Prime Minister. So they are talking Syria on all fronts. Hmm. Just the act of hiring John Bolton, that in and of itself, has to have put Syria, North Korea, China, yes. Russia, all on notice. Fair point to make. Uh, we will see, guys. Any moment now, a decision can come down from this White House. Uh, for the now, though, uh, he will be sitting down for a working lunch uh, with the uh, uh, Amir of Qatar. And certainly Syria and other things will be a big conversation there.
Meanwhile, National Guard troops arriving at our southern border as three governors of border states begin deploying troops in response to President Trump's illegal immigration crackdown, saying the move will make our country safer. So will California jump on board or will it choose to resist? Plus, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg gearing up for his first day of testimony before a Senate committee amid growing backlash to a massive privacy scandal. What we can expect to hear from the Facebook founder and whether the social media giant can regain the trust of millions of users. I don't want him to spend all this time saying he's sorry. I don't want him to spend all this time saying I accept responsibility. We know he's responsible. It's his company. I want him to say, we've identified the problems. Here are the solutions. I'm going to implement these solutions. And I'll be back in six months to tell you how I did it. All eyes on Capitol Hill as Mark Zuckerberg gears up to testify before a joint Senate committee this afternoon. The Facebook founder under intense scrutiny amid privacy concerns following a data mining scandal that Facebook says compromised the personal information of, remember it was initially 50 million, well it turned out to be 87 million users, and that number could even be higher than that. Here's Senator Chuck Grassley, chairman of one committee questioning Zuckerberg today. This brings into focus the, the sharp realization of 87 million people of what Facebook can let the world know about you uh, if they don't uh, do their due diligence and protect that privacy. All right, Herman Cain, you're a businessman. Yes. This is a big deal for a guy who's maintained a lot of privacy for his entire existence as the publicly traded CEO. He's on the hot seat today. Do you expect this to be a big moment for the company. Yes, you got two issues here. One is how will the stockholders respond to what's happening in the Facebook? And I think we're going to have to wait and see. But the other thing is, the only other big issue is the privacy issue. They started out Facebook as a social media platform. They have now wandered into trying to become a political influence platform and that's what's causing a lot of ba backlash. It's not that the information is being used mm -hmm. to try and analyze potential voters. Look, we all get get that sort of treatment. I can go on and look up something that I don't even care about and then the same day they're sending me stuff related to it. Mm -hmm. This is what they do to all of us. So this part is not new. The only thing that I think is going to come out of this is some sort of recognition about the degree to which the users or the customers have some privacy rights. That's always going to come out of this. Well, I, I would add to that, though, Herman, in that uh, there seems to be positively absolutely no remorse for the fact that Facebook, uh, well, yes, it can offer you these connections. It does some bad stuff, too. For example, you had a senior executive that recently came out. You all saw the letter that was circulated internally, and he was making the case, effectively saying, look to the employees, there are times when we may actually be connecting terrorists. There are times when we may be yeah. connecting people. Our that mission are bully is to kid. connect people no matter the cost. No matter the cost was yeah. the quote. And I thought to myself, wow. how despicable. Despicable. How absolutely despicable is that? No care for human life. And if that's the attitude among some of your top executives, this guy, by the way, still works there. But, 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 fire I, I, I want to make sure we show the other side of that because they responded to that and said, first of all, they were disappointed that that got leaked, okay? Because they are Whoa. a publicly traded company and that sort I of information imagine. is private. But their response, Lisa, was, well, we are, we are a growing company and our, it is our responsibility to you know, project or to forecast all possible outcomes, good or care, bad, though. so we know how to react to them. Well, I mean, I mean I've is... been in the minority on this side of this conversation since the beginning because I think it's a bunch of baloney, and the only reason this is an issue is because Facebook got caught up in Trump's orbit, which anyone that gets caught up in his orbit gets destroyed by the mainstream media and those on the left. And that's what's happening with this. As I mentioned, the Obama campaign did the exact same thing in 2012. Hillary Clinton, it was reported that her campaign did essentially the same thing heading into the 2016 election. All of those members of Congress that are going to be questioning them are all hypocrites. They have utilized Facebook's entire business model of monetizing data to help win elections and to target voters. And I think what Facebook is trying to do, as Mark Zuckerberg is going to try to do, is try to get out in front of this to some degree. He's well, allegedly going to say he's well, embracing, you know, the honest, uh, what is it, the Honest Ads Act, which changes disclosure yeah. for online ads so similar I, to cable. I want to jump in ads. here with this idea that you were touching on, Herman, and that's of the 
promise of privacy? Because I think generationally now, most people know that you aren't going to get much privacy no. if you're online. If you want privacy, then stay in your house and lock the door, close the windows, and don't call or text anybody. Right. But that's ridiculous. So we know that we're going to go online, we're going to have some exposure. So where Facebook and others are going to be challenged, because it's not just this company, is where do they get to the point where they say, you know what, your privacy is worth something. Maybe there is some way that we can do some business together where you know level up, level up, level up, where you're giving us something that's valuable and you get something in return. Well, as I don't know what that will look like, Trish. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we pay. Maybe, maybe it's a, a dollar ninety-nine to use the service, and then they ensure that no, your data no, is protected. That's not what Mark Zuckerberg's saying. Herman Cain, Mark Zuckerberg's saying we're going to pay. He already put out a statement ahead of this, or he's. Spoke to senators yesterday, and he said, "We are going to take a huge hit to profitability for security. To well, your it, it, his, security. For his security, his, but but what we're talking about is monetizing it so that the user yeah. knows about it. Yeah, it, it, and maybe you do need an absolute. Maybe there's a competitor." to Facebook out there that we're not even talking about yet. You know, the we kids are like getting them, sick yeah. of Snapchat His at this biggest point. challenge is going to be himself. <laughs> That's true. And the fact, I mean, does anyone honestly believe that he's going to successfully try to convince these members of Congress that he's on this or to change the narrative? we got to give last word. He's not, he's not good so. in interviews. I, I, don't, I think Herman, that this is not going to help Facebook to any happen. degree. No? Not going to happen. Not going to ease so fears? status quo nope. for them. It's going to be status Facebook. quo, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, wow. well, there you go. <laughs> well, I think we set that one up. The, that much anticipated testimony <laughs> and questioning begins for Mr. Zuckerberg at 2 o'clock Eastern time today. Be sure to keep it right here. We will take you there live as soon as that begins. And this is just the Senate hearing. The House hearing is tomorrow. And the battle over the border continues. Some states sending National Guard troops to beef up security after the president's order. But so far from California's governor, crickets whether the president is winning the political fight when it comes to immigration and our country's security we debate i want to go back national guard troops are arriving at our southern border as requested last week by president trump now three of four border state governors have agreed to cooperate with the new federal effort to crack down on illegal immigration you're watching video of Arizona National Guard troops deploying. Arizona Governor uh, Doug Ducey says this is exactly what his state needs to fight crime. The conversations with Secretary Nielsen and with President Trump have been around the drug cartels and the human trafficking. That's <laughs> Thank goodness we have a federal government that will finally pay some attention to what's happening on the border. Even some states, which are not on the border, are offering to send their troops. South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster says he's in talks with Texas to lend a hand. But remember I said three out of four border states? California's Governor Jerry Brown, who has repeatedly fought with the president over immigration policy, has yet to say whether he will cooperate. Shocking. Nope. <laughs> I don't think it will. You don't think it's going to happen, nope. Herman? Nope, 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 nope. He's not going to do it. Let me give you a statistic that will blow you away. Okay. 12% of the U.S. population is in California. They get 33% of all welfare payments. That's why they don't want to close the border. They want to continue to build their welfare roads. And California has made it possible for illegals to get driver's licenses, which is a ticket to register to vote. That's why Governor Moonbeam, I'm sorry, Governor Brown is not oh my going goodness. to say anything. Also in the state of California, just to add to the list here of things that we're talking about, we saw the first state appointee. Uh, who's an illegal immigrant, a young woman, yeah. uh, get a job. Let's go back to this idea, though, of what you're saying in terms of the census, because that's, that's what you're getting to. That's exactly It's right. how many, and we've been talking about this conversation, so how many people are in your household, when you give that number for California, it pumps yes. up the population, which attracts more federal dollars. That's what you're talking that's about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. They've got about 54 legislative seats, so the Republicans are trying to protect all of the the, the seats that they currently have. The Democrats have a majority. But this whole thing for California is they want more illegals for more votes for more people in the household. That's what this is. I, don't know, I think it's a wait and see still on California. They haven't said no, right? Um, and I, I was just looking who this was uh, Ron Vitello, the Ac acting deputy commissioner of U.S. Customs mm -hmm. and Border Protection this morning. And he's been kind enough to give us an update along the way here what we're hearing from the states, the governors, and the, the movement of the National Guard down to the border, which um, is quickly building because governors are showing willingness to send yeah, their, right. their guard members down there. Um, but he says that the conversations are ongoing and there are, you know, 
There's progress being made. Well, there's some give and take, right, Trish? Because uh, California's got that sanctuary state that they want to have. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a little bit of negotiating that they're going to try to do. Yeah, I, I, I'm surprised we haven't heard a definitive answer yet from Governor Brown. I, I'm tempted to, to side with you on this, Herman, in that I do not think that this is something that he would want to uh, throw his weight behind. But um, look, I, it, it, it's, it's clearly a problem. Our border patrol has not been able to do it on their own. This is at least putting some recognition to that. And I think saying, look, either we're going to beef up the border patrol, we're going to put the National Guard in, whatever it takes to secure our country because we are, Lisa, a country. So we're seeing from these governors, Lisa, um, a list of the things that the National Guard will be doing, you know, kind of behind the scenes to support. Right, and it's the stuff that the National Guard also did under the pre past two administrations with George W. Bush as well as President Obama when they sent the National Guard uh, to the southern border as well. But put me down in the no column as well for California <laughs> on this issue because I have to report the news. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, you know, you can just go ahead and put me down because it's completely <laughs> contradictory to his political and worldview yes. on immigration and illegal immigration. So why would you think the guy who embraces <laughs> sanctuary cities and basically sanctuary well, states here's a thought. Um, would go Do along with You want to have the one section of border that is not protected. Now think about the signal that that sends uh, to the nations, because we, we talk about Mexico, but it's Central and South America that yes. we're seeing those unaccompanied minors coming from in many instances if they don't get stopped by Mexico and sent back, because their policies are pretty stringent. Well, there's a little bit of a glimmer here. Some cities are revolting against the sanctuary state. I'm not saying it's going to change the whole landscape, but I'm that's a little too. bit glimmer that some of these local officials are saying, no. We're not going to go with that. And they're joining the lawsuit of the Trump administration. Right now, National Guard troops are headed to the border. Yeah. The president said he wanted it, and yep. we're seeing some governors make it happen. A different version of events from two former top law enforcement officials. Is that news? Well, apparently it is. New questions now that former Attorney General Loretta Lynch is speaking out about her tarmac meeting with Bill Clinton just days before the FBI announced it would not recommend criminal charges against his wife, Hillary Clinton. That's always an issue. As I said at the time, I knew that it was going to raise questions in people's minds. I believe that they have evidence. Welcome back. Loretta Lynch, the former attorney general under President Obama, is speaking out for the first time since leaving public office. And she's doing it just ahead of the release of former FBI director James Comey's book. Lynch was asked in an interview about that infamous tarmac meeting she had with Bill Clinton in 2016, just days before the FBI decided it would not recommend criminal charges against Hillary Clinton for her use of a private server. She says they spoke about innocuous things, and she said this. At the time, I knew that it was going to raise questions in people's minds. So what you do is you always consult the legal experts. You always get a legal answer as to whether or not recusal is required. Um, and had it been, then that's what I would have done. Instead of recusing herself, she publicly announced that she would accept the recommendation of the FBI. That led to James Comey's public exoneration of Hillary Clinton. You'll remember a congressional testimony. He said that the tarmac meeting convinced him to go public. So, Herman, let's kind of start at the beginning here. Do you buy Loretta Lynch's explanation that they just discussed innocuous things? I want to use the word you used earlier. Okay. Baloney. <laughs> it's bring it back. Bring it back. <laughs> baloney. Secondly, where was the raid? There were no raids during that administration. Uh -huh. No raids. Now, all of a sudden, we got a raid on the president's private attorney. It's the second raid we've seen. It's Manafort. all baloney, period. Now, that piece, along with all of the other pieces, is intended to do one thing, drag all of this hot mess out until November, at least. And like Trish said, it'll probably go on. Mm -hmm. I don't believe her explanation whatsoever. I heard her do an interview where she said, well, it was 105 degrees outside. Well, he shouldn't have been out there. So, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Her reason for meeting uh, with Bill Clinton, I yeah, missed that. Was because it was hot outside? It was hot outside. Well, she, so she, said, she did Trish, say that. Now, now we yeah. also have uh, two different accounts here, right? So James Comey is saying one thing. Loretta Lynch is saying another. Why the differing accounts? What do you make of that? I, I think this is a CYA by Loretta Lynch. I mean, yes. she's, you know, it was hot outside. That's why we had to meet. Yeah. I think they had to talk about something. 
Just grandkids, a little something. Grandkids trash. <laughs> but, but a little beyond the grandkids. But what about the differing in accounts? And was right to say, okay, now I, I've got to explore this. This is not appropriate no. for the two of them to be so, meeting by any stretch of the imagination. No. She put him in that position. I'm going to, to be it. perched when the book comes out because they don't agree on this point. She says that when they were talking about call it an investigation, no, call it a matter, that he didn't seem fettered by that at all. He says it made him queasy. Now, those are oppositional, and somebody's not telling the truth. We won't know who, but what else is in that book? Well, and Sandra, to that point, James Comey's about to hit the media circuit to sell his book. Uh, what questions would you have for him on what Harris just is laid out? Is anybody telling the truth? <laughs> yeah, somebody's right. not. You yeah. know, I, I mean, she said that she said when she looked back at Comey's testimony, to, to Harris's point, uh, she said, "I don't know. I don't know what the issue is. What I don't know why well, he was queasy." She over. said that he didn't indicate that there was even an issue, which is interesting because apparently he doesn't agree with his own feelings about being if, queasy. If she had womaned up and uh -oh. took the leadership position, she wouldn't have said, "I took the FBI's recommendation." No, she should have said. I believe that this is the right thing to do. Absolutely. Well, do you That's think she should have recused herself? Absolutely. She should have recused herself first, but if she didn't, take ownership for the decision, not blame it on Comey. How hot was it outside, by the way? I'm uh, 105 degrees. I'm sorry. It could get what even hotter. Lynch said. It could get even hotter for her. <laughs> it could. Inside. <laughs> well, and I'm particularly interested in just seeing how this impacts James Comey, as I mentioned, as he, as he goes out and he hits to sell his book. And I also wonder, you know, Harris, do you think we're going to get any answers, um, even with the Inspector General's report, looking into how the Hillary Clinton well, investigation, had certainly this is going to be an issue that's uh, looked IG's at. IG's report is going to be explosive yeah. in a lot of different ways. It's going to be like a full-on gymnastics. I, I talked about the same thing with Jason Chaffetz this morning, and he, like, he trailed off at the end of the interview. It's about that IG report. Yeah. Yeah. We're outnumbered in just a moment. We'll be right back.